Okay, I've been given the thumbs up. I'm allowed to start. <laughs> I also was mic'd up, which meant I couldn't talk to anybody without it booming out, so that felt a bit strange too. Um, hello, good afternoon. Uh, my name's Roger Bretherton. I'm uh, a uh, university lecturer at the University of Lincoln. Um, I'm also a clinical psychologist, and uh, this afternoon I, I want to talk to you about um, a mindfulness program that I've been practicing, playing with, researching, various different contexts uh, for the last five years or so. And some of the things we've found, what it is, how it works. I, I basically want to talk about three things, really. How, how we can put together mindfulness with, with some of the areas of positive psychology that some people call character, strengths, and virtues, so good qualities of character. How mindfulness and those two things can fit together really well. Uh, I'd like to talk through the program itself, so just actually just give you a rundown of how we do some of those things. Some of that will be very familiar to you. Some of it will be a bit unusual. We can talk about that. And then I'll just finish with, with a couple of the early signs of what this particular kind of program might be doing. So it's very, very early days uh, research-wise with it. I think there's about roughly a dozen or so groups of people around the, the globe working on this, um, different parts of the planet at the moment, um, and um, there's just a few encouraging signs coming in at the moment, and I, I'm one of the people who's working on it, but my data isn't ready yet, so I can't, can't tell you about mine quite yet, um, apart from some of the qualitative stuff. But before we begin, I, th I think it'd be good to start by being mindful. I always think that whenever you speak about mindfulness, you should be mindful in doing it. Um, I have a friend who says that if you have mumps and you're speaking about measles, people still get mumps. And so it's kind of like you have to kind of be what you speak about, I think. Um, and particularly at an event like this where I'm a bit activated, I'm ready to go, and I'm a bit nervous about it, it's good for me too to be mindful with you. So if you're used to being mindful, you just might want to sit in a relaxed way, put your feet on the floor. If for some reason um, you don't like mindfulness or you'd rather not do this, just feel free to be quiet for a few moments while we do that. That's fine too. Um, and we're just going to follow a very, very simple three-step meditation for about a minute or so. So firstly, just be aware of the room. You may have your eyes closed, but just be aware of what's around you. The sounds you can hear the temperature of the air. Maybe your feet on the ground, your back against the chair. Just allow yourself to be here now in this room. And now allow your awareness to rest on your breath. Just notice your chest as it rises and falls. Notice the air around your mouth or your nostrils. As it comes in, it's cool. As it goes out, it's warm. Notice how each breath is unique. It's the same but different. And now broaden your awareness to your body as a whole. Just notice how you're doing. How does your whole body feel? Areas of warmth or coolness, places of tension or relaxation, perhaps some areas of comfort or discomfort. Just notice those things. Just be mindful of how your body is. And when you're ready, perhaps take a deep breath in and open your eyes and return to the room. So, um, in the mid-90s, I trained as a clinical psychologist, and I don't really know what was going on in academic publishing in the mid-90s. But there seemed to be this idea that if something had to have heft and weight and authority, that book had to be published with a maroon cover. <laughs> Don't know what was going on. The truth had a color. That color was maroon. 
And so when I was training as a clinical psychologist, on, on the, the sort of first week of my training, I was handed the big bad book of abnormal psychology. And week by week, chapter by chapter, I sort of learned thousands of really nasty ways to judge people. So as I read week by week about anxiety and depression and what have you, I saw my family, my housemates, everybody I knew, my course mates, all in that book. Even worse than that, what I discovered was I started seeing myself. So first week, I was anxious. Second week, I realized I actually had depression. Third week, no, I was obsessive. Fourth week, you know, paranoid schizophrenia. Um, three weeks later, I was really bad PTSD, which was really awful because I was just getting over my personality disorder from the week before. It was that kind of thing. Um, and and the, the thing I loved about being a clinical psychologist, and I still am a clinical psychologist, is that when clinical psychology does its job really well, it takes those kind of words and it makes them understandable. So people who are difficult, problematic, hard to understand, we struggle to grasp. Clinical psychology gives us an understanding and a story that allows us to say, aha, that's human. I understand that now. I've got it. I understand it. And so it humanizes. And weirdly, when we humanize someone else, we kind of also humanize some part of ourselves as well. So we're not scared of that scary bit in ourselves, or the paranoid part of us, or the depressed bit of us, or the bit of us that likes to panic in some way. And so when I started in clinical psychology, I was actually working um, in a uh, personality disorder team. I was largely working uh, with a population who were chronically suicidal um, or self-harming. I was using an approach called dialectical behavior therapy, which some of you will know of. And it uses mindfulness right at its core in terms of helping people to sit with difficult emotions, tolerate distress, um, sit with impulsiveness and things like that. And uh, one of the things that dialectical behavior therapy really focused on quite strongly was to constantly listen for what it called the, the golden grain, if you like, the golden grain of truth. When someone comes and says something that seems really crazy, really outrageous, uh, what's the truth that they're trying to convey? Maybe it isn't in the factual content. Maybe it's in the emotion that really they're saying, I'm really distressed, and here's the understanding. And so DBT um, started me on a journey over the last 20 years, which was beginning to ask the question, really, what is it that might be missing when we're distressed? In other words, not just what's wrong here, but what is the thing that we could input or we could learn or we could go with that would allow us to thrive a bit more, to function better, to live life in a better way? And um, those of you who know psychology will know that round about the turn of the millennium, a fairly famous psychologist called Martin Seligman founded a movement called the Positive Psychology Movement, which drew on a lot of stuff that had happened before then and kind of put it all in one place. So as president of the American Psychological Association uh, in 1998, he stood up and he said, it's time that psychology turned a corner. We've been obsessed with the negative so far. I think at that point, the research suggested that for every one scientific article that had been published on something like kindness, love, gratitude, humility, etc., there had been 26 published on things that were negative, like stress, depression, etc. And he said, it's time for that to change. We've got to start having a language that's every bit as sophisticated about the good things in life as we have about the, sort of the negative, if you like, the, the problematic areas of life. He, he wanted to develop a sort of science, not of just what's wrong, but a science of what works. When things go well, how do things work? And so we started off with this really, really unusual project. It was, it was um, funded by um, the VIA Institute for Character in the United States, based in Cincinnati. It was a multi-million dollar project, and they gathered together the 55 leading psychologists of their time. That's what they said. And no, I wasn't invited, and, and it does still hurt. But, but, but they gathered together, these 55 people, and they said, what we're going to do is we're just going to do some wide-ranging research to try and discover how can we come up with labels and concepts that allow us to really research good things in a comprehensive way. And so the first thing they did um, was actually a historical trek. So, so they, they tried to find every piece of world literature, whether it was Buddha, Aristotle, Plato, Confucius, Jesus, Muhammad, Moses, and tried to think about what are the themes that seem to come up. Whether, wherever human beings have tried to say, what does the good life look like, and come up with some vague list of rules or virtues, 
what are the themes that emerge? And after doing that piece of work, they looked at um, quite a few hundred documents that stretched over about 2,500 years, and the six big themes that came up for them were these. They, sa they said, so over the last two and a half thousand years, roughly um, all over the planet, whenever people have tried to answer the question, what does the good life look like? They've said, well, we welcome knowledge, people who are wise and know what they're doing. We welcome courage, people who push forward, not just physically, but also morally. Uh, we welcome humanity, people who tend and care for the people. We welcome justice, people who make sure that society works and that things are fair. We welcome temperance, those, those virtues that guard against excess. They stop war blowing up, people who know how to forgive, who know how to control their impulses, who know how to lower their grandiosity. And we welcome transcendence, which includes spirituality, but it includes lots of those other things where humans transcend the immediate moment through gratitude or wonder or humor. And so they came up with these six big themes, and, and one particular psychologist, Robert Biswas Diner, earned the nickname the Indiana Jones of psychology because he went all over the world asking lots of different people, D does this make any sense to you? So he went to the Inuit uh, in Greenland and did ice fishing with them or whatever they do and said, you know, do, do these things make sense to you? And, you know, worked out, do, do you, do you kind of welcome these things in your children? Do you try to develop them? He went to the uh, Maasai in Kenya. They went through a branding ceremony for courage where you're, you're branded with an iron and you're not allowed to scream because that would be very unmanly in their culture. So he's branded, he became part of the tribe, and then he asked them the same questions. And he went to students in Illinois, probably the most uncooperative group of people he worked with overall. But basically going all around the world kind of asking, does this make sense? And roughly people saying, yes, these things do make sense, some more than others, etc. But as psychologists, we're a bit more awkward than that. Um, we, 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 so we always want things to be measurable or, or, or really well defined or, or able to kind of look at them and measure them and see if they go up or down and can we develop interventions. And so what Seligman, Peterson and Seligman did um, during that time is with these 55 psychologists, they, they came up with what they called 24 character strengths, which all kind of sit within these virtues uh, they sort of attach to all of these. And they see these are kind of 24 strengths which we're kind of going to make our manifesto for studying the positive in human living from this point onwards. Um, and the 24 strengths look a bit like this. Now, I have to say a couple of things about this. Firstly, when I'm talking about this with my students in Lincoln, it takes me about four hours to get to the point where I can say, so I'm happy to talk about these as if they're true. Um, don't have time to do that today. <laughs> so um, the best way I, I would describe them is this, is that they're a really good language for us to learn in order to begin thinking about good things. There's some things we might argue are missing. There's some things even on there you might argue shouldn't be there. There's also an interesting fact that, for example, I mean, Paul Gilbert this morning was talking about how kindness isn't compassion and love isn't compassion either, and where would we fit that kind of thing in? Whereas from this point of view, the compassion literature and many of these, those things fit under kindness. So each of these isn't a sort of very specific point to research. They're kind of multiple cluster of lots of different things under them. That we're just kind of using a language to begin with to talk about them. And uh, I think my favorite way of summing this up is, uh, was, was um, by, um, there's a group of psychologists in Zurich who've studied this a great deal in all kinds of different ways. And the way they've summed it up ultimately, is they've said this is a good language for an international conversation. It's a good language for us to talk about what's good. We don't have to get too hung up on about is it absolutely, totally, absolute truth. It's a good language for the conversation. Um, and certainly, I've been presenting this all, all over the world at various points. I've got this slide in various different languages. Um, I have a PhD student who's just run the associated psychometrics through about 1,300 people in Qatar, so translating all into Arabic. And so, it, you know, it, it works in all kinds of different ways. And the questions that come up when you apply it to a different culture, they're interesting. And, and they're worth working with and thinking about because they help us to think about things. But just for today, we're going to work on the idea that we're just going to talk about these 24 character strengths. And so that, that, that's, that, that's sort of the origin of positive psychology. That was sort of the first big positive psychology um, project that came out. So let's shift over for a moment to mindfulness, shall we? Now, my favorite definition of mindfulness, I actually don't know who said it, and I, I've presented this in many rooms like this, so if you do know, you can shout it out in a minute when I put it up. 
Um, but it, it was given to me by my mindfulness teacher. And his favorite definition of mindfulness is very simple. It was simply this. Being in the present moment without wishing it were otherwise. That, that moment just to press pause, just to wait, just to be in the here and now. For psychologists, it's often John Kabat-Zinn uh, seems to be the sort of default definition, particularly for clinical psychologists. Uh, and many people end up with this um, definition from him, paying attention in a particular way, on purpose, in the present moment, and non-judgmentally. Um, I think in another definition, he goes on to talk about the importance of self-compassion in that definition. But the interesting thing uh, when it comes to thinking about mindfulness from the perspective I'm going to talk about it is uh, Shauna Shapiro um, uh, and her colleagues came up with what some people call the IAA definition of mindfulness. Some people will call it the why, uh, what, and how definition. But she effectively said, so mindfulness really consists of three things. It consists of firstly an intention. So why are you doing it in the first place? What's the thing that motivates you from your heart to be practicing mindfulness? Secondly, attention. So that's the moment-to-moment -moment awareness in the present moment, pressing pause. And thirdly, attitude, the quality of attention, bringing acceptance and kindness and curiosity into that frame. And um, positive psychologists have got quite excited about this definition because they say what, what this allows us to do is move away from the way mindfulness has been used quite a bit in clinical practice, which is it's very good at dealing with long-term depression, it's very good at helping us not being stressed, it's been used in all kinds of different ways, in personality disorders and all those kind of things, and begin to say, hey, and there is another intention, which is quite often shared by spiritual and religious beliefs, um, but it can also be shared in positive psychology interventions, which is the idea that mindfulness can also be pursued not because we have a particular problem in mind, but because we want to flourish and we want to live well, uh, because we perhaps want to live ethical or good lives, and actually mindfulness might be a really good way, uh, a, a good discipline to learn how to do that. And so from this perspective, suddenly there's all kinds of rooms to start thinking about how mindfulness involves many of these other character strengths that I've been talking about. Um, Bishop Patel, I put Bishop Patel because actually there's about, I think, 10 people in this reference, and they all got together to try and say, what are the key ingredients of mindfulness? And interestingly, from their point of view, the functional definition of mindfulness involves two key character strengths from the literature. Um, the first one is self-control self or self-regulation, the ability to control, to be undistracted, to focus, to stay in the present moment, to draw one's mind back when it goes away. Um, some people even define mindfulness purely, that mindfulness purely is just the return, and the return, and the return, and the return to the present moment. That if you spend 20 minutes practicing mindfulness today, and you spend your whole time pulling your mind back from where it drags off, well done, you, you've had a good time of mindfulness. That's, that's part of the practice. And they said, and also an attitude of curiosity, which is also, um, in those character strengths, that, that curiosity is just that, that, that sort of intense, but sometimes gentle interest, a sort of adventurousness, a wondering, a curiosity about what's going on. And so the interesting thing about some of those definitions of mindfulness is that they, they already incorporate certain elements of the character strengths and virtues that positive psychologists have been looking at for a while. They're kind of already there in mindfulness. There's sort of a, a, a kind of play between mindfulness and these sort of character strengths and virtues that are being studied. And so mindfulness-based strengths practice tries to play between the state of mindfulness and character strengths and virtues in two ways. The first thing it does is this. It says, we can be mindful of using our strengths. We can be mindful of the moment when we're doing well. We can be mindful of our hope. We can be mindful and dwell on our gratitude. We can be mindful of our humility. I've recently done quite a bit of work on leadership and humility, and one of my favorite definitions of humility that comes out in that research is just the quiet ego, which sounds very similar to where mindfulness is. So mindful, mindful strengths use includes things like this. So thinking about those moments when you're at your best, when things are going well, when things are fantastic, actually being mindful, watching those things, being aware of them, spotting them in that moment. But also, 
it can also be mindful of you at your worst. And although this kind of model has a bit of a, it has a, bit of a reputation of being a bit too panglossy and a bit too light, a bit too fluffy, all feels a bit like pink fluffy unicorns dancing on rainbows, how does it deal with the pain and the trauma and the difficulty of life? Well, it does it in this way. It says that mindfulness actually allows us to think not just about our strengths, but maybe about those days where we underuse our strengths. I should have been hopeful but instead I despaired. I should have been creative, but instead I conformed. I should have been wise, but I brought shallowness to that moment. I should have been brave, but I was a coward. So we can be mindful about, this is what I was trying to do, but this, this is what the actual outcome was. Equally, we can go the other way. And in some ways, this is more likely, that things we're really strong in, we pull out too hard, too fast, too powerfully in the wrong moment, and suddenly something that's our great strength becomes a liability in that moment. Um, I think about people I know who are extremely kind, for example, and their kindness becomes a bit intrusive. So I meet them in the corridor at work, and they say, hi, Roger, how are you? And I'm like, fine. And they say, no, how are you? And I'm like, I'm fine. <laughs> no, how are you? And I'm like, well, I was fine until this conversation started, <laughs> and I'm not quite so much anymore. But sometimes even those things that are kind of a gift to us, the things that we give to the world, can become problematic when overused. And from this point of view, mindfulness is a way of beginning to look at the golden thread. So those moments where we feel we've let ourselves down, haven't been at our best, um, how can we just take moments where we reflect on those times? And we say, okay, that wasn't great, but what was I trying to do? What did I overuse? And this is a very kind of Aristotelian idea, the idea of the, the golden mean, that somehow ethics lies in this active, dynamic process of trying to work out what's the appropriate thing to do in this moment. Not always easy to know what the right answer is that question. And then the other direction mindfulness-based strengths practice goes in is it says, yes, so we can be aware of using our strengths mindfully. We can equally go the other way, and we can begin to use our strengths to build our mindfulness. The number of people I've known who uh, doing mindfulness in a very sort of pure way was a real struggle for them, but the moment they started to be mindfully grateful or mindfully kind, or they started thinking about, how, I know some people who their root into mindfulness was joy, a very humorous and joyful I joy life, and then suddenly I can humorously and joyfully and playfully be aware of what's going on around me. I know of people who actually, uh, mindfulness has begun at the moment they decided to forgive someone and let something go, and that was a mindful moment for them. So some of those things we're sort of naturally strong in, and we can use those things to actually build our mindfulness so that mindfulness, in a sense, becomes easier, becomes more natural to us. It somehow fits us in a better way. And so those are the two directions that mindfulness works in. As you'll see, this, this was the three-step process we did at the beginning. And you can see how, from a mindfulness-based strengths practice point of view, we were being curious to begin with, then we controlled, and we became focused, and then we became wise. We started to expand our perspective and think about how am I as a whole right now? The sense in which we're using character strengths when we're being mindful. So with six minutes to go, let me mindfully but quickly take you through the ingredients of the program. So mindfulness-based strengths practice, therefore, um, is eight sessions long, and the core topics are these. So it starts with mindfulness and autopilot, as MBSR or MBCT may do. Think about mindfulness as a resource, uh, an opportunity, uh, something that extends time rather than constricts it. Then in session two, we begin to actually get people doing psychometrics and thinking about what are your strengths? What do you bring to the table naturally um, yourself? Then we start to actually use those strengths to overcome some of the obstacles people have, not just in mindfulness, but in life generally. People give up on mindfulness, I, I didn't have the persistence. Okay, how could we bring persistence to that? I didn't have the hope. How do we bring hope to that? We then um, use those mindfulness to deepen and maintain mindfulness. How do you keep this going? How do we spot those things? We take it, um, if you like, externally, and it's, it's all about social space, a kind of mindfully nourishing self and other relationships, thinking about how mindful strengths use works in social arena. And then in session six, we talk about the golden mean, or mindful strengths use for reframing and perspective. Where did you let yourself down and what was really going on there? And how can we be mindful rather than judgmental about that and sort of bring it to where it needs to be? And also we talk about mindfulness for authenticity and goodness. So being a better you, being a better person. 
And then in session eight, we stick to practices that work well without reversion. In other words, we start asking the question, okay, of all the things we've done over the course of this module, this eight weeks, which have really worked for you? What's your learning and which ones do you want to take with you? So there's therefore a whole series of core practices in mindfulness. which look like this. Each, each session involves these. And I'll, I'll show you the, the book you can sort of pick these up from um, in a moment. But it's basically each one, um, each session revolves around the idea that we start with an opening meditation to let go, to be in the room, to be here. That we then usually review what we did last week then um, we have a period of time of just, and now we're going to just introduce some new ideas. So that's a bit of a talky bit, it's not that long. Uh, we never try and be more than 20 minutes away from mindfulness in any bit of the session. We're always ready to go into a mindful practice at any moment. We then practice whatever we've just talked about. So we practice in the group. We, we, we talk about how people found it. Um, just last week, we were doing loving kindness meditation. A lot of people found that it evokes loss and sadness for them. So we're talking about that. What, what was going on there and why did that happen? And May, sort of normalizing that, not making it weird, and just saying that that's, it's not unusual that if you evoke love, you sometimes find loss is in there too. Um, each, each, each of these sessions takes two hours, and a large part of that is actually the virtue circle, which is mindful listening and speaking. And what's amazing with the people we've been doing with recently, we've done it with undergrads, we did it with six formers last year, we're about to go with six formers again, we're currently running it through the doctoral school at the University of Lincoln, so PhD students completing it to help them. And we've actually found that the biggest bit of feedback we get is that the virtue circle is really helpful, that this is the bit they like, and that gradually, bit by bit, people develop this language of spotting good things in other, other people, and the virtue circle becomes their opportunity to say and do that. Each week sets some homework and then a closing meditation, which again is about putting people back in the present moment and transitioning them back into the working day or whatever's going to come next for them. So just before I finish, let me talk you through um, a couple of pieces of research that um, have been published in the last couple of years that just show us where MBSP is going at the moment. Um, so first thing I have to say is MBSP was devised by Ryan Nemec. He's the education director um, of the VU Institute. If you look him up online, you can find him. You can find the book. I'll show that to you in a moment. But when he first designed it, he'd been practicing mindfulness for, for several decades before he developed this. Um, and in his first sample, he just did um, a group of eight versus control. Um, and what he found was that the MBSP group reported increases in flourishing, engagement, signature strength use, which is basically how much do you use what you're best at at home, in community, and in relationships. Um, some of you might know Itai Ifsfan um, locally at the University of East London. And Itai um, and some of his colleagues, including Ryan, um, did an online MBSP um, process, and they looked at 19 um, people in the sample, 20 in the control. Um, and what they found was that the MBSP group rep reported increases in life satisfaction, flourishing engagement, and again, in signature strengths use, the number of times they're using what they're best at um, around them. Um, just last year, a uh, Mexican sample, so this, again, this is no control group on this one, eight participants, um, and they found, interestingly, on a sort of multi-dimensional flourishing scale of well-being, they found that the largest changes were in meaning, so people found their life more meaningful, um, and then followed closely by they felt more positive, they felt they achieved more, um, their relationships improved, and they noticed they were more engaged in life and felt healthier. And then probably the most recent piece of research, this has been done by the Zorik Group. Um, so this is uh, Dan Dan Pang and Willie Rook. Um, and they, they basically did a, 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 that says MBSP, and that should say MBSR and MBSP. So they were um, looking at strength practice versus stress reduction. 
and they had five time points, pre-post, one month, three months, six months, and they found that at, at post, MBSP and MBSPAR both reduce stress and increase well-being. MBSP particularly seems to improve task performance. This is why many businesses are very interested in it. And then at six months, MBSP increases job satisfaction. And this seems to be one of the things that's coming up time and time again is people's sense of competence, their sense of contributing to the world goes up. There's also some measures we're doing that lo looks like anxiety and depression also go down for people doing MBSP. So I'm afraid I'm out of time, but if I just... Um, finish there by saying, so, so I, I'm quite engaged and excited about what's going on with MBSP. If you want to um, look at it more closely, um, you can pick up this book by um, Ryan Nemick. I did ask for it to be knocking about in the bookshop here. And then finally, um, this is me and this is him. So if you're interested in anything we're doing, please do get in touch. We'd love to kind of tell you more um, and get you involved. Thank you very much. <laughs>